Hi, howdy, and welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. And we're back with Eric Adventure Man giving an update on his trip up here uh, late summer and some of the other stuff, the stops and the sites and the interestingly bizarre things that happened on the way up here, on the way back, and subsequent to that. Welcome back to World Bigfoot Radio, Eric. Hey, Duke. I'm excited. Uh, God, so many things have happened since I left your place. Um, yeah, there's just a plethora of stories, and, and I recorded a lot of them so I don't have to blabber for five or seven minutes straight. People can just, you know, we, we got some videos that we're going to incorporate into this uh, interview conversation, whatever you like to call it. It'll be, it's going to be fun. Though. I'm looking forward to it. Well, as those of you who watch previous episodes with Eric know, he's sort of the roving reporter. And when he goes around the country and uh, has these experiences, he films them and then uh, intermittently will stop by and give us all updates on everything that happened. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the uh, episode Intruder in the Valley of the Giants. But uh, first of all, uh, stuff that happened on the way up here. Okay, so yeah, so I was uh, heading over to uh, Pocatello, Idaho. Mm-hmm. I got a text message from Becky Cook, who wrote the wrote several books, I believe four or five books, uh, Bigfoot in Idaho, Bigfoot lives in Idaho, Bigfoot still lives in Idaho, my neighbor's a Bigfoot, I mean, <laughs> she's got all sorts of, <laughs> she's amazing, and Bigfoot she's, Bigfoot uh, just found potatoes in Idaho. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what's amazing, she, what she does is uh, she collects the stories, now she's not a boots on the ground researcher, she collects the stories, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm cool with that, because if somebody's got the stories, then I can go meet the people that told her the stories and I can go to their spot and I can interview them. I can go out in the field. I can research their area. So that's what I did uh, on this most recent trip uh, when she sent me the text saying that, yeah, we got a Bigfoot rendezvous in Pocatello, Idaho. Uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, uh, Cliff Barackman. Uh, uh, my, I believe it's Mike Freeman, who's the son of Freeman, who, by the way, is is, is a badass. I, lo- I love that guy. I mean, I, when I say badass, I mean that affectionately because this guy's a smart dude. He's on it. He's he's done some great research uh, and putting together a book and a video that he's going to be coming out with, and I'm pretty sure he'll be on your show in the near future. His dad um, is else? the one that filmed the uh, famous Freeman video, which got attacked by all the other supposed Bigfoot researchers in the back west. Who all tried to say that no, some unknown guy that we don't know couldn't actually film Bigfoot, even though we failed to find anything but TV cameras in the woods for the last 30 years. So that was uh, some ridiculous uh, shenanigans there. And as far as Becky Cook goes, Becky Cook, I've already met her, got to spend a weekend with her at the first Big Sky Bigfoot conference where we were both speakers. And in addition to having these books on Bigfoot out, her other point of interest is that she's on the list of one of the 100 tallest women in North America. She's big. (laughs) She is tall. Yeah. And I might have mentioned in a previous interview that we did that she grew up on a reservation and uh, she actually had uh, interactions uh, with the Bigfoot as a child and I believe mind speak. And so when she talks about it, she's got a smile on her face and almost like a giggle to her when she's talking about it. And it's it, I, I'm totally convinced that she's telling the truth. Uh, it's like, it's wild, though. Um, um, my friend Arla, she's Cherokee Choctaw, who lives in Oklahoma, and she she has taught me a lot about that. But she says every time she goes into the woods, she always leaves her name, which is an A for Arla. And she said as she comes back out of the woods, a lot of the time, whoever's in the woods will also leave their mark underneath hers. And I think that's so cool. But she, so I asked her, I said, um, she explained it in the way she said, um, if you speak American Sign Language and you go to Britain, Britain has Britain Sign Language. They're similar enough that you can communicate, but it's not exactly the same. I guess it is. But it's compatible. You can sort of understand each other. And she said it's kind of that way across the United States with various Indian tribes. The old, the elders will teach. They, that's how she learned. The elders taught her how to communicate with glyphs with uh, various other tribes. So um, she said, always put an X. This X is welcome. And so my son took that to heart, my little nine-year-old, that, that when we met her, 
And he would put those out and he's like, Mom, you gotta check this out. Because the Bigfoot would communicate with him all the time. And I was thinking it's probably because his mind was so much more open than we as humans, older people. You know, we're already, we already come with a predetermined value system and a, a belief system about what is and what isn't. But kids don't, you know? So he would put things out for the Bigfoot and they would accept them. So I actually started putting apples out in February because most apple trees don't produce in, in February. <laughs> but the Bigfoot will take the apples because they're, they're good. And uh, throughout some time, I think I put 11, 14 different apples out. And the last time, um, I had this great big apple. It was huge. And I set them out on this, on this um, section of fence way out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> And I set them up biggest to smallest and left them. And when I came back, that big apple had one bite taken out of it and literally had taken half the apple. But you can see the teeth marks, just one bite and left it. And, oh, the honey. And he was going to say something about that because it was about the same time and place. Um, so Bigfoot liked melon. He really liked melons. Watermelon, honeydew, cantaloupe, you name it. And I, I, I had this honeydew melon that had seen its better days. It wasn't dead, but it just wasn't wonderful, you know? So I took it out there for the Bigfoot, and um, there was this row of trees that were old cottonwoods, and one of the limbs had fallen out, so it had this hole. You know, like, think a hole that the squirrel would leave its nuts in. It was really high up, so in order for me to get the honeydew in the hole, I had to stand on my tippy toes with my belly against the tree and my hands way over my head, so roughly eight feet up in the tree. And I tipped this honeydew into that hole. And then I, 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 I swear I took a picture, but I've never been able to find the picture again. But anyway, it looked like an eyeball. It looked like an eyeball on this tree. It was really cool. And then I just walked away, and I came back about, oh, say eight days later, and this is like August time period where it's really dusty and dry in that area, and um, honeydew was gone, and there was nothing on the bottom of the tree except for these two footprints that were just massive. <laughs> just massive, and like, I didn't have any way of measuring of just holding my feet up next to them, but I swear they were about 20 inches long. So much bigger than the other footprints that I found, and nice, really wide, like this wide. But of course, it's standing in dust, you know. So there might have been just the poof factor, you know, when you put a foot down in the poof. But anyway, just huge, huge footprints. But it was a lot of fun. <laughs> and I, I just thought, that is so stinking cool. And someone's like, well, you should have taken a picture of that. You should have cast it. And I'm like, normally I just don't carry around, you know. Or but yeah, and Becky Cook was there, and then there was this new couple. Uh, we're kind of new to the scene. Uh, I believe it's Squatch America or Sasquatch America. They got a YouTube channel. Uh, this couple, uh, basically, their story in a nutshell was they uh, they were both they were teachers, and they owned a home. I believe it was in Oregon, and then COVID hit, and they went camping, and they got up in the Blue Mountains, where it's a hot spot. I'm sure you know, and many of the researchers know that Blue Mountains, Oregon's a hot spot. I haven't been there yet, but I've been I've been invited, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, trip, but anyway, and that's where um, the Freeman so out... film was uh, filmed. Blue Mountain. Oh, is that right? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah that's and the, uh... the anchor of the Blue Mountain chain, the furthest one to the west. I can see it from right here. Wow! It goes right into the uh, uh, Bitterroot Mountain Range, which is kind of bizarre because usually mountain ranges run parallel; they don't go at right angles to each other. But there you go. Yeah, they're on. A, they have an expedition going on there right now. Uh, I was. Uh, I was invited, but I just couldn't couldn't get up there this time. But they're still having. I mean, they're saying there's still activity up there. Like as of right now, they're still having activity. And this particular guy and his wife, uh, they had an experience there that uh, changed their life. <laughs> I laugh because isn't that how it works for most of us? We have an experience, and suddenly we're doing Bigfoot uh, research and talking on the radio all the time. And it's not because we got nothing better to do. It's just that we're possessed by the Bigfoot spirit. You know, it's like this is. Just like this, my life has changed for the better since big. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there really is this big, weird, hairy thing running around the woods. Holy bleep. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, so uh, so they talked about uh, they basically what they did is they uh, they decided to quit their jobs. They they sold their house. <laughs> they bought a big RV and a big uh, uh, extra cab dually uh, 
Dodge 350 four wheel drive. They tricked it out with all the cameras and the whole nine yards. I mean, it's I've got pictures of it. I'll send them to you so you can include it in this uh, this interview that we're doing right now. But so yeah, they're out there doing their thing, uh, and they're all excited. I think they're kind of a. Uh, this is their first year, I believe, maybe their second year. So uh, so it's interesting because it's always kind of cool. I'm sure for you even, like when I was kind of a newbie, and, I, and I'm still to a degree a newbie, but I, I feel like I've taken, you know, what might take a guy one year to, to get information. I've been able to get like three or four years worth of information in a very short period of time. So I'm, I mean, and if you're out there all the time, you're talking to people all the time, you're, you're getting in your car, you're driving here, there. You can learn a lot pretty quickly. And that was one of the questions that uh, I asked Jeff Meldrum. They had a panel, and I'll, you'll have that video. You'll be able to pop that in there. But I asked him about what is the uh, what he would recommend as a beginning researcher. What would they say would be a good way to go about uh, the do's and don'ts is what and I said to him. time that you've been out in the field, if you were going to give advice to people that are also going out in the field, what would be a few of the do's and don'ts that you would pass on? That's a good question. That is, yeah, and I'm not going to see how, what, what level to address that on. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I, I always advise people who want to do field work is to identify locations that are close to home. Um, I mean, I, I learned that as we were fortunate enough to get some uh, funding for field work. We often expended far too much time and energy and resource darting around to different places trying to follow up. I mean, the old the old approach of reactionary research kind of. And um, uh, it's, it's like, uh, I've often said, it's kind of like buying uh, a lottery ticket or winning the lottery. Um, you're not going to win if you don't buy a ticket. So the more tickets you buy, the, uh, the more chance you have of winning too. And so likewise with field research, if you can identify areas that have the appropriate habitat, you know, use that rule of thumb that I, well, I guess that was, that was a different talk, different place. <laughs> a, a, a rule of thumb is if, if uh, the habitat will support a black bear population, there's a reasonable chance that it potentially would support another omnivore, namely a Sasquatch, uh, and vice versa. Um, so if, if you're hearing reports in the middle of Indiana or middle of Kansas and there hasn't been a black bear there, since time immemorial, or they've been extinct for 200 years, then the chances are that habitat would not support another large omnivore, at least on a, on a regular basis. So once you have a, a place identified, frequent it, get familiar with it, get acquainted with the resources, with the sign of the animals that are found there. You know, it's, it's the same kind of thing. If, if you go out, we were talking about, uh, you know, numbers, uh, and this is another rule of thumb, of one or 200 black bear per one Sasquatch seems to be a pretty good fit and that independently bears out from the data we have for lots of different uh, states um, if you go out in the woods and you never see a deer you never see a fox you know you never see a rabbit what are the chances of you seeing a sasquatch you know so you need to cultivate those abilities um, but of anyway so going back so yeah so there was that and then there was a guy named mike I think it's Marcel or My Mycel. I can't. I can't remember how you pronounce his last time. Another great researcher, uh, Abe uh, Abe Canyon. Are you familiar with the Abe Canyon story? Oh yeah, yeah. He's he's he went out there recently. Uh, uh, did the Abe Canyon uh, expedition? Took Bobo and a couple other people with them, and he had a sighting. Saw two Bigfoot run across the road. Uh, that's going to be coming out uh, in in. In the future, matter of fact, I'll send you a clip on that. If you're going to have so much, so many clips, you might have to try to you know, cut this into two shows. It's too much there information. Myself, Rowdy Kelly, and Bobo. Uh, the two production assistants get in the car and they split. Uh, they went down and back down to California, Humble. And then Kim is like, I I'm going to go back home too. Okay. So the whole plan was for Rowdy and Bobo and I to go back to the highway where we get cell phone reception find a place to stay, stay, find a place to eat, because we were going to do some more filming in the newspaper office at, at Myrtle Point. So, okay, uh, Gordon and Sam, uh, they were gone. Uh, Gordon and Jameson, they were gone, long gone, back to Humble. Kim had just left about five minutes before me, and I was like, okay, I'll meet you guys down at the highway. I'm going down the road, and there's Kim. She's parked off to the side of the road. And um, I rolled down my window, are you okay? And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just looking at a map. 
about a lake that I want to go visit later. Okay, goodbye. I drive down the road, and Kim leaves a short time after me. And I can, it's dark. It's about 5 o'clock in November. Forest with trees. And this is this is precipitous area. This southwest Oregon area is, area is sort of like a, a granite and marble uplift. So it's like a mini Rockies. It's incredibly steep. And the Forest Service Road is going off to the left. It drops incredibly steeply down to the Sixes River. And then road cut and then incredibly steep shooting up that way. Um, as I'm driving, I'm going about 25 or 30, and I can see Kim's headlights behind me, maybe about half a mile or so. And I round around a bend. I don't know. It, it was it was dark enough so that I had my headlights on, and I drive like an old lady. Sorry. Um, sorry to the elderly women in the audience. Uh, and my side, my brights on, and I round around a corner, and my first impression is, who the hell is playing? in the middle of the forest at night. Its movements were, okay. How does, how does Bigfoot walk? Patty. That's what, that's the way Bigfoot is supposed to look like. No. This was so disturbing because I had never seen in live in front of me or um, on video, anything move like this. It was jerky and it was fast. And it, it was like, it was the only thing I can attribute it to is like seeing an insect, like a beetle or a dragonfly start to take off. It's like, oh, an insect, like not movements, but that kind of speed. Or, or like going to a preschool or elementary school playground and seeing the kids play. Game of chase. The, the move. <laughs> My next thought is why, whoever's playing in the middle of the road, why the hell are they wearing a fireman's outfit? Big, bulky legs, big, bulky arms. It looked like they had a fireman's suit or a traffic flagger suit on. And I realized later, I go, crap, it was yellowish blonde. Once in the middle of the road, just, just coming up out of the brush, out of the, out of the side, hits the road, as I, and I, I keep on driving. And uh, about a, I'm taking my foot off the gas. I'm about 200 feet away, but I'm gaining on it. As I'm gaining on it, it's crossing the road and just pauses briefly and looks into the brush from where it came from, keeps on going, and then a second one comes out from a crouching position, and they're a little bit shorter, and they're, they're hauling it. This is about 75 feet, 100 feet away. By the time the first one gets to the edge of the road, the second one has caught up to it. By the time the second one gets there, I'm right on top of it. No, um, no hair around the face. Heavy brow, <coughs> short-ish hair. Definitely yellow blonde. But it was, um, well, that's kind of my sketch. This is a sketch as I did that night when I got back to the when I got in the hotel. Flat nose, big brow, but yellow hair. But no, no real hair around the face. And so I'm right on top of it. So I am on top of it. So I am driving, and I almost put my foot on the gas again. I, 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 my heart was racing. And um, I know this sounds stupid, but again, like being T-boned at the intersection, um, I knew that I, I was not going to be able to not talk about it with friends. And um, I realized it splits a split set. This all this has lasted like five or six seconds of my life. Um, I knew that I was going to talk to Cliff, talk to my Bigfoot friend, Bigfoot research community friends. And I, I know the first thing, if I kept on going, they'd be like, why didn't you stop? So I take my foot off the gas, put it in park. I don't turn off the engine. 
And I am very, very, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not so confident about exactly where they came out of the draw out of the woods, but I know exactly where they had exited. And I stand up and I look, oh, that's the empty road. That's the next train. That's me. That's my Honda Accord. You tell it's me. Um, my, my heart's racing and I don't know what the hell it was. And um, the most disturbing part is that my estimation is that by the time I'm standing up and I'm looking into the woods, they would be like 75, 100 feet up into the woods. And there's no brush sounds, there's no breaking branches, there's no sound at all. And I suddenly realized whatever those two things were, they're standing there, they're looking at me. And all this heat starts rising up my neck and and in my ears. And I, I'm really freaked. At that point, Kim is caught up and she stops and she says, Are you okay? And I was like, Well no, is there an accident? And I was like, something just crossed the road. I'm like, oh my God. You know, so she blasts out of the car. And Kim is like incredibly enthusiastic about Bigfoot. Perhaps a little bit too enthusiastic. She's like, everything's Bigfoot. Everything's Bigfoot. You know, she won't shut up about it. Um, and, and so we're looking here. And we're looking down there. And, and just looking around. And, and the next thing you know, Here's some headlights. Here's Bobo and Rowdy. This is like about three minutes later. Bobo parks first behind Kim. And I go up to his window. And he goes, oh, guys a riot. Dude, was there an accident? You know? And I was on a flat tire. And I was like, no, I'm like, something, something just crossed the road. He's like, you saw a squatch? And I would dumbly... Um, held up my fingers, and I was like, I, I saw two, and he's like, holy shit, and he goes back to Rowdy, and, um, and it, Rowdy's like, what, and uh, a squ two squatch just crossed the road, and Rowdy was like, who saw it, was it Kim, <laughs> <laughs> and Bo was like, no, dude, it was Mark, and Rowdy's like, it was Mark, holy crap, and he pulls out the camera and starts put, put a mic on. He's like, start talking. You know, I want to get your reaction. They were able to get my reaction about, maybe about four minutes after it happened. And Kim and Bobo and I are standing on, on the gravel. Rowdy's, uh, when, you hit the, when you're at the edge of gravel and you go up about, I don't know, about 10 feet for like a four, four foot rise or so, then there's this sheer rock outcropping that's about 12 feet tall and then the dirt keeps on going up steeply up into the woods Bobo and Kim and I are standing there and Rowdy's up there with the camera and he has this really big light and he's standing along the top of the rock and Rowdy sees it all, all three, all of us see it at the exact same time at the top of the rock outcropping where there's a little bit of moss and detritus and stuff, there's this scrape that's brand spanking new of where the moss and detritus had been scraped away and it was about that wide, about that long as if something either with a foot or a hand tried to gain the rock and slipped and made the scrape. It was it was brand spanking new, fresh, wet. That's, that's my rough cross section of the road. Um, really damn steep. Road bed, dirt, there's rock out and then bam up there. We, the next day we made our way up there just to look for any kind of prints or any more evidence. We found some impressions. Nothing really castable. This is dirt, but it's also, you know, granite marble uplift, so it's very, very rocky. So there's not really good ground to really make a decent impression. But we were standing there. I was just guessing, okay, my car was parked here, and maybe they were up here somewhere, and we were looking down, I don't know, a good 50, 75 feet to where they may have been looking down at me. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so uh, the, let's just stop right there for a second because before I got to Idaho, I stopped in Draper, Utah, where my friend lives, and he's into the uh, UFO uh uh, Scott Skinwalker Ranch kind of stuff. He's more not. He's starting to get into Bigfoot, but he hasn't really done any Bigfoot research yet. But anyway, 
So uh, I'm staying at his house. He lives on this mountain up there about 6,000 feet up. Uh, and you've got this view of these other mountains. Uh, you, there's no camping up on this mountain. It's uh, the Wasatch Mountain. It's it's all rocky and, and, you know, there's trees and terrain that you just, there's no way you can get up there and even explore, really, unless you're a professional hiker. But anyway, so one morning I get up, it's about five o'clock in, in the there, morning. there, had a Bigfoot sighting there in my oh, really? cousin's uh, summer 1980 came in on the border, the western border of Wyoming. There's a river there that flows up into the uh, flows out of the Wasatch Mountains. So we just went up river for about a week. That's how we got up there. <laughs> wow, that that would be fun. I, I look forward to doing a river trip some point because I think that the uh, anyway, yeah, that, yeah, we were on. hiking though. So you walk a week up river, that means you're walking a week back down river too. You know, hope you have enough food with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but this, uh, this particular morning, uh, I got up, I was drinking a cup of coffee, just sitting in the, in this chair, charging my phone, you know, looking out the window, N you know, nothing on my mind, nothing really just, just happened to be looking out the window. And all of a sudden these lights, uh, started appearing on the mountain, not above the mountain, not, uh, I'm not landing on the mountain, but right there, kind of in the middle of the mountain. And I've got a little video that uh, I posted. I'll, you'll be able to play that uh, here probably also, which was pretty amazing. So I saw um, these crazy but lights. The, but then the next morning was time to get in the car and drive to Pocatell, Idaho. And uh, and so that was that was kind of like one of those things where, wow, I wonder what those lights were. I wonder if that's something that happens regularly. Um, and as I'll tell you later on in this conversation, that uh, they're there. All, they're, I, I filmed them four times. On the way back, I stopped and stayed at his house several more days to recover from our trip. And, uh, and yeah, there, and he filmed them too. So there's, and I filmed two of them moving and they're very good videos. Uh, you'll see when, if you play them on this show here, you'll, the people will see these are, there's nothing fake about these videos. There's no, there's no roads up there. There's no hikers with flashlights. Uh, there's no, you know, just it's, it's to me, it's a no doubt about her. So anyway, uh, moving back forward. So we get up to, I get up to Idaho, um, I walk in and, uh, I got, I got to tell you a quick story. I, I don't know if I, if I'd sent you this yet, but there was a, there's a bunch of people standing around outside and there was a boy out there about eight, 10 years old with his mother. And I said to him, I said, uh, so what do you think about Bigfoot? He goes, he's cool. And I go, <laughs> I go, really? <laughs> so I, you know, I'm just asking the kid questions and the mom's not really paying attention. And I said, so did you, have you ever seen Bigfoot? He goes, yeah. I go, really? Hey, does, your, does your mom know about this? She goes, yeah. He goes, yeah, I told her like 20 times, but she never listens to me. <laughs> oh, God. So then about that moment, the mom's kind of who who wasn't paying attention. Now she kind of turns her head and she's like, what do you mean you you saw Bigfoot? You never told me about that. He's like, mom, mom, I did tell you. I've told you like 20 times I saw a Bigfoot. So I said to the mother, can I record this? Uh, your son telling this story and I won't show his face, you know, I'll just kind of hold the camera down. So I recorded him telling his story about the time that he was hiking with the Boy Scouts or the Cub Scouts, whatever it was up there in Idaho. And they were in this forest area and he said he saw Bigfoot come out behind a tree. He looked at it, saw it and uh, told his friends about it. And of course, they didn't believe him. But but, you know, what what makes an eight or 10 year old lie? You know, I just I just I thought he, I felt like he was telling the truth. He yeah. seemed kind of nervous to tell me the story, but it was a cool little story. Say your name. So, so uh, how old are you about, Ten years old. Okay, let's walk this way so you can... So what happened? Tell me the story. So, I was just doing a little activity stay thing for my shirt. Hiking? Yeah, just hiking on the bike trail near our house. Were you by yourself or with some friends? With with my activity stay. So there was leaders. kids? Yeah, there's kids with me. Other kids. They didn't see it because they weren't, like, paying attention to so, and so you was it in the daytime or the yeah, night uh near it was like like right now okay and so you're out there and you guys are playing having fun no and we're you're like hiking hiking I, around i was getting uh i was um i was collecting i was collecting quartz quartz okay cool and off up in the hill i see like a nine eight foot tall thing was it dark? Yeah, it was like very dark. Like so this brown was up, black. 
How, if you were going to say, was it like a football field away or a half a football field? or Half a football field. That's pretty close. It's like 50 close. yards. And was he hiding behind the tree or was he standing out in the middle of nowhere? He was just hiding behind a tree and checking me out. Was he kind of leaning over and looking at you or he was just leaned over and he didn't try to hide from you? or? He was leaning over and looking at me. Yeah. So he's being kind of sneaky. Yeah. So he was standing up. He wasn't. He wasn't on his knees. He was standing up behind the tree. No, he was like. He was close to on his knees. Okay. Just, so he's kind of bent over, kind of. Yeah. And then, how long did you look at him for, approximately? Uh, about ten seconds before I had to catch up with the rest of my group. So, so wow. So, did you? Were you scared? Uh, a little. Yeah. I've never seen a bigfoot before. And did you actually think you actually looked in the in his eyes? You saw his eyeballs? Yeah. Is they're like, like about like that big. Yeah, here, hold your hand down here and show me. Down at the camera. Down the camera. About this big. Wow, they're big. What color were they? Uh, they were a brown green. Wow. Kind of like my eyes. And did he look like he was like really like a giant football player or a big wrestler or was he big like husky? Yeah, husky, like big. Huge. Yeah, like. Bigger than any human you've seen, maybe. Yeah. Like no, no doubt about it. Bigger than your dad. Yeah. Okay. Wow. All right, buddy. Thank you. I appreciate um, that. Anyway, so we get in there and, um, you know, got to meet Mike and, and talk to Jeff a little bit and all the people. And then and then the conference started. And then we got Becky did a great presentation as usual. Uh, her information was great. And uh, and then Mike did his presentation. And then let's see what else we had. Uh, uh, probably my favorite part of the presentation which uh, you should you'll be able to play this in your show here was a lady she did about a 12 minute presentation an indian lady named Roxanne about the um, about their tradition on the origin of bigfoot and i thought oh jeez these people know who how bigfoot came to be i can't wait to hear this and uh, rather than spoil the story right here and now, but it's a great story. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, you're going to have that. You can play that little video, and then people can actually hear her say the story, tell the story. I've got permission. All the videos that I've shared with you, I have permission to share, so there's no copyright stuff going on there. And he 
It's a sharp, quick whistle. Yep. It's not a tree. It sounds similar to what we're hearing up there at the camp, it doesn't does. it? Yep, it did, yeah. Like what we heard this morning. These motherfuckers, but maybe they followed us down the road here. <clears throat> Are we going to see another tree fall, man? It sure looks like it. Look at these fuckers. Oh, really? Shit. It's right down here. It's moving around. There's more than one of them. Hear that? Hear the clicking in there? Yeah, I do. When, when we were walking out, and I said, William, are you over there? And you said, yeah, I'm up here on the road. Uh -huh. But I was hearing crackles and pops in the, over here is what I was hearing it. Like, like things driving me crazy. So make me want to walk back in there. Well, it's across the river, whatever it is. Well, honey. 
catch you until you learn about what you have done. Today, when you see or encounter one of these beings, you must remember that they were once native human beings. And they are a reminder to tell you that beauty and goodness comes from within. And this is a story that was told by the Achimawi people, the Pitt River tribe of California near Mount Shasta. Now at this time, I'd like to share with you my grandmother's perspectives. My grandmother said that these beings are newcomers. To us, they were newcomers. And they are creatures, and today our people refer to them as piano. And in areas, if you know about the antelope, they're indigenous, right? To North America, right? And they'll stay in a location, they'll cross in a location, no matter if there's development. There are places in southeastern Idaho where rivers have been reverted, but yet these creatures will walk through ancestral paths. Can you click the next one? Today, my people, as indigenous people, and I'm not just speaking about Bonabanics, but I'm speaking about the Achimawi, the Miwoks, the Maidus, the Indians along the coast in Grand Ronde, that all the Indian people, we acknowledge these beings in different ways, with images, with songs, masks, stories, but the most important thing we do, because we know that they're, they were native beings, native people, we give them sanctuary. We don't hunt them. We don't even try to look for them. They come to us. And their presence is very, very powerful. And I'm sure that many of these native people that are gathered here can tell you, I have smelled them. They smell like a dead animal, but with an extra musk. I've seen their footprints. I've felt their presence. And I'm not talking about 10 years ago, five years ago. But we experience it. Last month, last week, last year, that is our experience. We believe that they're drawn to us because of who they are. Um, I'd like you to go back. This is a pictograph that's 2,000 plus years old on the Tule River Indian Reservation. I had the opportunity to be a uh, powwow. Um, I was there as a head judge. And while I was there, the Yokut Indians, they have a family here. And they say that the, the one, the the painting coming down from the eyes is a sadness wow. of their existence. And today, the tribe, when they do their bead work, they bead the Bigfoot on their regalia. And this is super fascinating to me. Look at how old that is. And then what I want to share with you on the other half, the Bannocks tell a story that there was different colors of Bigfoot. There was brown ones, black ones, and red ones. And they said that for some reason, the red ones became cannibalistic. And they would carry off the children. 
and so all these tribes and it was really interesting i thought it was just a you know a story about nevada and southern idaho i thought oh it's just a story from around here but when i went to work in california the yokuts the mayus the miwoks all the indians of the sierras they talk about destroying the red-haired ones they said that they stayed in caves and it was there that they burned those cannibal ones and they destroyed them in a mass destruction and so it's really interesting to say that the ones that you see today you will see them you will encounter them but they will not do what the red-haired ones did so it is with this that I'm sharing this with you and I hope that you appreciate it as much as I appreciate it, this origin story. I have a master's degree, I've done research, and so I always look for the primary evidence. I look for the origin of something that has happened. And this is a story that was shared by that medicine man. Our people made a song that I'm only going to sing a part of for him. Like when we say about songs. Thank you. Um, but anyway, so the, yeah, that was kind of the... There was that, and what else happened there? I'm trying to think. So much happened. Oh, and that's this guy. Uh, Dave was there. He was uh, lives in Swan Valley. And I might have mentioned him last time when I was on your show about this guy, Dave, who lives in Swan Valley, who Becky had uh, referred me to uh, as somebody who was in her book who had uh, has Bigfoot coming through his property up there in the mountains. He's got a bunch of acres. Uh, he's a ranch rancher out there. He's about 70 years old. And so he was there, and I said, uh, I reminded him, I said, remember when I was at your house last time and we heard those knocks on the window? And he says, he goes, oh, God, I totally forgot about that. You're right. You're right. I go, what what, what was that? What was, what was going on with that? He goes, you know, I can't figure that out. I couldn't figure that out. That's probably why I blocked it out of my mind. I couldn't figure out why there was something knocking on my window at night, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, but anyway, long story short, I said, you know, can I come back out to your property? I didn't get a chance last time I was here. It was dark come back out there in the daytime and you can show me around. You can show me your apple tree where the Bigfoot come every year and take the apples. You can show me uh, where you're, where the big, he calls them nests, these uh, tree structures, because I uh, guess where he's at there, they are tree structures. You're going to see in the video. It's a pretty great, pretty cool video actually. And, uh, and what they do, I, I'm assuming they do this in other places, but I personally haven't seen this except I did see it when I was at Williams place up there in Falk, Arkansas, this little nesting thing where they put pine needles and leaves and, and branches that still have leaves kind of piled up around the, uh, around the tree structure, the TP structure to kind of give them a little more of a, uh, camouflage, I guess. Um, so we went up there and, uh. We drove up there and he was telling me about uh, some things about how they found they found some bones up there and some of the bones had just literally been snapped. Like uh, I think he said between 11 and 16 uh, different animals that their bones weren't broken. They were like snapped, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting. Uh, and then also he talked about, uh, I don't remember here, yeah, the tree structures. Yeah, we, so we, anyway, rather than me tell a story, I'll just let you play the video. <laughs> And do you think people actually even come up here where we're at right now? Okay. So you, so you don't have a lot of humans just walking around up here, right? I don't think that's it. It might be. Maybe we ought to go over here. I think maybe I think it's over here. And I said, oh, there, look at that new road, and then right back past it towards that spot, and there was a, a trail. Yeah. And you said, well, that looks like a, you, and I said, no, it goes in there, and then it turns into a trail like this. Well, this meets that trail. Okay. It's a beautiful trail. 
There's enough to trail you on a high climb without a, a firearm, I'm assuming. Here's the first truck, man. Oh, fuck yeah. But this is what's left of it. Because this was the biggest tree in the woods. And when it kept going, look, look at the tree, look at everything. Look. Oh, yeah. But this was all part of it. This was way up into the tree like this. But here, about 15 years ago, this tree fell over. I don't want this thing to be here. I want to go. All right. Show you where the deal is. But you can see clearly that something was woven together here. structure right here. I don't know if you know that. See how this tree's bent over? And see how it's pinned down over here underneath this tree? See right here? Yeah. This is what they do. I just want you to know well, that. There, there's where they're right here. Oh shit, yeah. That's probably why it's This biggest tree in the forest. 30 miles. Right? Wow. Oh god, yeah, I can see where it's okay. here was the structure. Right there. Oh, wow, yeah. They climbed up this tree. Look. And they broke all these branches off. And they took them. And they piled them here. And you would sit right here with the dog pad. Right here. I could see it. It's pretty obvious. Well, you ought to have seen it when, when all the needles was on. Oh, that needle's all over it, huh? Yeah. They said, look. You see how they, it was all piled up? Yeah. You see the extra pieces? Look over here. Oh, yeah, I can see it totally. Because this is a no doubt about her, is what I'd say. It is what a huge problem when I saw it. I had my buddy, here. I'm listening. I had my buddy stand here. And all this stuff was piled up on this juniper tree. See how? Look look this stuff. Oh, you can tell totally, yep. This is all piled, man. Oh, yeah. There's, there's nothing natural here. No, nope, nothing. You're exactly and right. So I started ripping it apart, and Kevin says, before you rip it apart, we ought to take a picture. So he stood right here, and he was completely underneath this canopy. Completely underneath this canopy. This is the pit. There was a nest here, and then right here. Get out of the way, Captain. There was a nest right here. There was a nest right here. And you can still see, sort of, after three years, you can sort of see the outline of the nest. Yeah. See, I see tracks. I do too, actually. You know, I don't know what they are, but because they're too old. But right. there was a nest here, and there was a nest in there. But this nest out here, honest to God, was twice the size. I mean, this nest was, it was down, it was down to here to there. That's how big this nest was. See, this shit's falling down. Yeah. But this is all piled up. And you look, there's nothing there. And they took all the branches. They climbed up this tree. Well, dude, right over here is a little mini nest over here, too. I mean, you saw well, the... that wasn't here before. This is, this is part of it, too. Well, that wasn't here when I was... But you could see clearly that they leaned all this shit up in here. Well, I don't know where that came from. Well... Because that's after I got... That's after I left here. See... I don't, I don't know what, what that deal is. Yeah. But see, all these things here, these were all power. Oh, my God, it was unbelievable. You got those pictures at your house, right? I think you showed them to me last time. Did I show them? Yeah, I want to see them again if we have time when I go back. No, I, I think I, that's what we need to do. Because I could compare them at least. But that's the biggest, oldest tree. And here's what got me. That fucking deal up there was the biggest oldest tree, and it tipped over and ruined their fucking deal. Okay. So what did they do? They came down here, I don't know, three, five, ten years later? I don't know. And they did, made this. But you can see, 
It's three years old. I'm sorry. But, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, it's all good. I could tell it's something though. This yeah. is this was not man-made. Yeah, but look. And this it. didn't just fall like this. No, it's but obvious. Look at this shit. They piled all these pieces up. Uh -huh. I didn't do that. Nobody did that. No, there's no reason for it. No, and they climbed up that tree, and they broke off three, four-inch branches to make that nest. Wow. No, I just... I was, you walk down in here at all a little bit? Or do we have, do we have time to do a little quick little mini walk down in there? Just to, just like for about 20 yards or so just to see? Well, there's nothing else. But you never know. We might see something new. Oh, well, you know. You never know. And looking over here to your left, that's a pile of something that's going on over there, too. Where the hell are you? Going? Right here. That was made. That's, that's part of a deal that they put down there. Oh, yeah, I don't know what that is. I don't know either, but... I mean, you can say that. I mean... You don't know. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, you know, I don't... I'm just telling you... I'm going to look down here, and then I'm going to walk to the right here. When I had the pictures of that right there, there's no question it was made by a Sasquatch. Not. Gotcha. The bed inside was probably... I mean, had the six foot long and four foot wide, and the bed outside was probably eight and a half feet long. Wow. And about five feet. Five and a half feet. Wow. And it was so long. I mean, it was so long. Yeah. So uh, let me just pause for a second. You got anything you want to interject or any questions you want to ask? No. You're uh, <laughs> you're covering it in plenty of detail. Yeah. Just don't forget right, that you we'll got see. the videos to cover all this so you don't have to set them up tremendously. Exactly. So that's kind of nice. So I don't have to retell the story because these videos, some of them are anywhere from, let's say, two to five to seven to 12 minutes long uh, or 10 minutes long. So there's so that you got a lot of good stuff right straight from the horse's mouth on this one. Uh, so what else happened? So. Um, so that was kind of the excitement around the uh, I'm trying to think if there was any other stories. Oh, there was a guy. OK, this was interesting. This this is not in a video. I did not record this. Actually, a guy came over to this guy, Dave's house uh, the day I was there. Um, I did find some footprints, by the way. He's got a barn out there. I don't think that's on video either. I'll send you some pictures of that, though. He's got a huge barn out there that used to have hay in it. And he said, I said, well, how come you don't keep hay in there anymore? He goes, well, because the Bigfoot were going in there and they were they were kind of trying to make it a home. And he goes, I didn't I didn't want them thinking that they could just come in my barn and, and just live there without permission. This guy's kind of a he's kind of a character. But so I, I went in there and he, he wasn't with me and I walked out there and I did see footprints uh, in the ground. They weren't big, but they were not, they didn't look, uh, it was weird. There's like four of them and that was it right in this one area, no other footprints anywhere else. And, and so I thought, well, you know, maybe, and then I went and looked out the apples, uh, which I'll send you some pictures of the apple trees. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm going to actually, I'm going back there uh, next week <laughs> because I really want to get a chance to, to spy out on this apple tree uh, with my night vision goggles and to see if I can possibly catch your catch these guys coming through the, the, uh, the area there taking apples at nighttime. This, this tree is probably about 30 feet tall. It's pretty tall. Um, so anyway, this guy shows up, this old timer, he's got about, he's about 75 with his wife and uh, he had a Bigfoot story to tell. And this dude, he managed to drag it out for about 40, 40 minutes. It, it was a great story, but he, he had every single detail in the story. It was like, uh, you know, he could have told the story in five minutes, but he stretched it out for 40 because he was he was excited about it. I don't know that he told too many people his story. But, yeah, these old timers, I mean, there's there was like uh, there was a lot of people at this conference, by the way. I mean, there was uh, there was more people at this conference than a lot of UFO conferences that I've been to and several more recent conferences that I've been to that involve Bigfoot. Uh, the only other conference that might have had more people was the uh, Moon Lake conference that I was at in Utah. And now since I just brought that up, uh, there was a, a storytelling uh, thing underneath uh, in this one area. During the daytime, people would come in. There, everybody would be sitting down at the uh, at the, at the uh, bench tables or kind of like a cafeteria setting, but it's outdoors. And people would get up for five to seven minutes and tell their stories. And they were telling their Bigfoot stories, uh, which I, I got a few clips for you on that. And then, of course, I felt I felt inspired because I never told my story uh, publicly in front of other people. I've told it on the radio, but never with an audience looking at me while I'm telling the story. So I, I said, all right, I, I don't know who these people are. They're, they all seem to be cool with the idea that Bigfoot's real. So I'm just going to get up there. And I told them a few stories and including the story that I had in Happy Jack. <laughs> Okay, real real quick. So um, I'm going to tell the story about Happy Jack. Before I do that, 
Uh, Ryan Burns is a friend of mine, and he told me about the Phenomicon in Vernal last year. So I came up here with another guy who rented an Airbnb about 20 miles that way. And we're out there, we got the night vision, and we we saw, and I've got amazing video if anyone wants to see it. Uh, this is a legitimate triangle. I don't know if it's ours or theirs or whose it is, but it's three minutes, very clear. And then uh, we went to the, the conference. We met this guy. Hopefully he's going to be here. He's a, he's a guy that lives in this area. He's got a long beard. And he says that he knows where the Bigfoot are up there in the Ashley Forest. And I says, will you take me up there? And he's, he says, sure. Let me show you my book. And he pulls out this book. He's flipping through all the pictures. And then he tells me that he's communicating with these guys. I mean, I don't, I don't know if, you, if anyone knows who I'm talking about, please let me know afterwards. You know I'm good. I'm trying to find him. I lost his phone number. Anyway, so he took us up there, and he showed us where the tree structures were, and then we're, he's talking, and uh, I'm recording the whole time. And very clearly, we heard this, just like that. We all heard it, and it was recorded. I mean, but it's, what was weird about it is um, it sounded close, but the volume was low, so I couldn't understand where it would have been. But it was very weird, almost like it was in another dimension to go into the woo for a minute. Um, anyway, so we did that. And then uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with World Bigfoot Radio. Duke Sullivan's a good friend of mine. If you haven't seen the Glag series or heard the Glag story, go get your mind blown on that one. I'm on my way there tomorrow, but I wanted to come here because I wanted to hang out. Uh, we're, we got a spot up there where I accidentally, unknowingly took a very good picture of a Bigfoot last year when I was up there. They pushed down two trees and they were whistling at us the whole time. So I'm a believer. I'm a, I'm, I'm a knower. There's the, there's, the, uh, there's the trolls, the skeptics, the believers, and the knowers. That's how I categorize them. Uh, trolls, I like to play with the trolls sometimes. But anyway, um, so we'll get to the Happy Jack story. So I was at my friend's house in Sedona, Arizona. This guy comes over. We're drinking beer. He says, I know where Travis Walton was abducted. I used to work for the Forest Service. My, my boss took me there. I said, take me there. We drove up there. We're 7,700 feet up, off the grid, five miles up on this Mogollon Rim. And he says, this is the spot. And I believed him because I, I didn't know what else to believe. So I went back down to Sedona, got my friends. I said, look, we got to go camp up here. Maybe there's still UFOs flying around because I'm a kind of a UFO guy too. And he said, so I got three of my friends that come up there about two and a half hours we drive up this dirt road, we're camping out up there, we're, we're partying, there's nobody within five miles, and all of a sudden, it was 8.15 at night, and this massive, I don't know if it was plasma, or some people would call it an orb, but it was 40 feet around, about 120 feet up above this tree, just came floating, no sound, floating. And, and I was like, I'd never seen anything that big or that close. And then for about 20 minutes, I don't know what they were, but they were coming over the top of us, so that, after that, we're, we're hanging out, we're drinking, it's about 10 o'clock, and we're playing music, and we're having fun, all of a sudden we hear sounds in the forest, and I knew nothing about Bigfoot, this was two years ago, I had no knowledge about Bigfoot, I didn't know about the Mogollon monster, I didn't know about tree structures, but I, we're hearing sounds over there, and I said, what's that? My friend says, that's the Bigfoot, I go, don't pull my leg, there's no Bigfoot in Arizona. He says, oh yes there is, there's the Mogollon monster, I go, what? So, long story short, the next night, Two friends go home. I'm still up there with my with my friend. We're hanging out. We're drinking. It's about 11.30, 12 o'clock. We go to bed. I'm sleeping in my van. Here's the campfire that's kind of smoldering. He's over here sleeping in, in the truck in his cab. He's got an extra cab. He just puts the seat down. And uh, I'm going to guess it was around 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden, he's honking his horn. So I'm laying on a mattress on the floor of my van because I pulled out the seats. And I hop up and I look through the window. And it's dark, but there's a little bit of light from the from the smoldering of the fire. And I see these two large, hairy creatures. Couldn't see clearly what they were. I didn't even know what they were when I saw them. But they're they're trying to, it looked to me like they were trying to reach into my friend's truck because his window was down. And that was why he was honking his horn. At that moment, I panicked. So I jump up, get in the passenger's in the driver's seat, and I'm honking my horn, thinking that whatever it is, maybe we'll scare it. I don't know. So these two things t turn, and now they're walking around the truck. My van's over here, and the door, the side door on my van is on this side where the fire is. And they came around this way. So as I'm seeing them come around, 
I jump down and lay, I'm, lay, I'm like a little kid. I'm hiding on the ground now, <laughs> underneath the blanket, peeking up. And I've got those tinted windows, so I'm trying to see if whatever it is is going to come up to the window. And all of a sudden, I see these two dark figures pressed up against my window. I've got that high top band. It's at least 10 feet tall. And the windows are about, about like that. I could not see their head or their face. So however big they were, they had to be at least 8 feet tall. And they're pushing on my band. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I, didn't, I went into panic mode. I didn't know what to do. And so it's, it's not coming off the wheels, but it's starting to move. And I'm thinking... What if these things push the van over and I land in the fire and I'm, tr and I'm thinking, right? I mean, these thoughts go through your head and me instantly in a moment. And so I thought, I need to get out of here. So I jump up, push open the door there on this side, and I sprint in the, in the forest on pine needles and rocks to the dirt road out there about 50, I would say about maybe 40 yards, thinking that whatever it is, I'm just going to run. So I get out to the, to the road and I'm running down the road. And I can hear my friend now, he's got his truck on and he's got the lights on. And I'm thinking, I, have, I didn't know what was happening. So I'm running and all of a sudden, not real hard, but I, about, I felt something push me down. And I went flat down on the ground and I did not want to look up. I, was, I didn't even want to see what it was that might have hit me. Thank God my friend's coming down the road. He pulls up, up next to me, I'm laying on the ground. And he leans over and pushes open the, the passenger door and says, get in. So I hop in. Now, Garrett, all of our stuff's there. My van's there. We got all our stuff. We drive back down to Sedona two and a half hours. We did not go back to that spot for three days. That's how traumatized we were. That's the story. Hear me retell that story. And then, of course, I had to do a shout out to uh, Duke Stolb and World Bigfoot Radio because uh, the Glag series still is, is number one in my book. And I just wanted people to know that if they wanted to have their minds blown, they need to go check out Duke Sullivan and World Bigfoot Radio, the, the Glag series. And, and if your mind's not blown after that, uh, give me a call and uh, I'll send you 20 bucks for, for your time. You know, <laughs> That's what I do now. It's like, okay, listen, just go listen to this. Just go watch this. If you feel like you've wasted your time, just call me and I'll send you 20 bucks. I'm serious. <laughs> You'll never have to send it out. Exactly. And the Glag Saga is still, you know, even though Kevin's gone, Glag's still alive. And some of the people that were around Kevin when a lot of this stuff was going on haven't uh, actually told the full, full details of their involvement in this story, too. So still parts of it coming out. Just had uh, D. Sims, Lady in the Woods on for Glag Apocrypha 3, Part 1 and 2. So if you guys somehow missed that, uh, go check it out. Grandma. Glag's grandma. <laughs> And a reminder, uh, GLAG uh, originally originated in Idaho, and, and right yeah. there in that, you know better than I do, you know, it's kind of, maybe he's bouncing back and forth between Montana and Idaho, I don't know, but the fact that it's, this is all happening in Idaho, and I'm hearing all these stories about Bigfoot in Idaho, for me as a researcher, what it what it does is it adds even more believability and credibility to to uh, Kevin's story, because it's it's a known fact that Bigfoot are in Idaho. So it wasn't like this was a one-off with Kevin. To me, no, it was there's tons of Bigfoot in Idaho. Well, yes. why? Because Rocky Mountains. What's in the area where I'm at? Rocky Mountains. Yeah. <laughs> Anywhere where there's Rocky Mountains, there's Bigfoot. It's not too hard to figure out. I did mention to a few researchers that I, I, I knew of a great spot in Montana that you, if you wanted to go there, you need to contact Duke and, and get permission. Maybe you can go up there on an expedition with him. Uh, but uh, I could tell this, uh, that even the more seasoned researchers that were there, uh, I, I told them about some of the sizes of the tree structures at your place. And, and I told them about the Whistler. And by the way, the lady that uh, Roxanne, who who you're going to play that, uh, or if you, might, you might have already played it on this interview, but the story about the... Uh, the uh, origin story of the Bigfoot talked about the whistling and how the Bigfoot whistle and that you don't ever want to whistle during the daytime. And she went into that whole dialogue and, and there was a lot of people talking about the whistling and I didn't even bring it up. So again, when, <laughs> so it's, and you got cool. to hear plenty of it when you were up here the first yeah, time. So, uh, so I'm getting confirmation that other people are having experiences that were similar to what you and I and, 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 uh, and uh, William Lunsford and, and what we experienced uh, when we were there, it, it was, again, not another one-off. I mean, for me, it was a first-time thing, but I guess it's, it's kind of common for a lot of guys that are out there. But they were excited to know that there were these massive tree structures and that the Bigfoot up there uh, were were friendly as long as you were pre-approved by uh, Robin. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> basically, yeah. we got to make sure Robin checks in with them, right, before before we send anybody up well, there. Well, you know, I went 
six years before I ever had any contact with Robin. It was just me being up there. I didn't have any kind of ability to communicate with him. It's all just about being respectful and friendly and having the right intentions. Pretty much it. So yeah. make sure that you're kind to everyone. Uh, safety first, last, and always. Pay it forward. Don't be mean to people if you don't have to be. Um, don't flip off the mountain giant. Don't poke dog man with a stick. Don't punt the puck, would you? And for God's sake, whatever you do, do not hug the Wookiee.